First of all, we have in the Psalm, Psalm 69, two things that you might recognize from elsewhere. 69.9, for the zeal of thine health has, hath eaten me up, or for the zeal of your house consumes me, and the insults of those who insult you fall on me. John 2.17, this is after Jesus has chased the money changers out of the temple. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. And in Romans, for even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. And later, Psalm 69, 21, they put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. In Matthew, during the Passion, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. So much that happens in the New Testament harkens back to and apparently is foreshadowed by the Old Testament. But let's take a look at Paul here in 2 Corinthians. I think this is one of the things that makes Paul so interesting. Well, I'm going to skip to down here. He says, so I made up my mind that I would not make another painful visit to you. Now, he's already written a letter to the Corinthians. It could be the letter that we read, 1 Corinthians. Some scholars conjecture that there was yet another letter in between the two. But we know that when he wrote to them last time, he had to slap them around a bit. And now he's saying he doesn't want to make another painful visit to them. You see, there's a lot of talk in the church about pastoral ministry, which means you have to understand where people are at and have a certain amount of compassion for them. And clearly Paul does. But part of being a pastor or a father or a leader is discipline and telling people the truth, even when they don't want to hear it, and even when apparently it makes for a painful in-person visit. For if I grieve you who is left to make me glad, but you whom I have grieved. He sounds like a doting father, or al he almost sounds like a Jewish mother in a way. I mean, that's a kind of a trope in comedy, but, you know, Paul is Jewish, and he's sort of overweeningly indulgent with his children in the faith, and is sort of worried, maybe even in, an, in a neurotic way, that he's offended them. I think that's one way to see this, to see his humanity and his worry that in disciplining them, he's upset them so much. I wrote as I did, he explained, so that when I came, I would not be distressed by those who should have made me rejoice. In other words, if he had come to visit them and found this case of incest, perhaps, that he referred to in the last letter, he would have been grieved in person instead of made happy by those whom he loves so much, his children in the faith. He thinks of the Corinthians not just as people he's administrating for, but as people he loves. He loves these people. He is their father in the faith. Oh, that our bishops actually felt that way instead of giving us lip service. I had confidence in all of you that you would all share in my joy, for I wrote you out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. When you're a father, you see, my daughter, she might never see this video. She won't because she doesn't watch this kind of stuff. She's very headstrong, Carrie, my red-haired daughter. Don't ever play sports with Carrie. Don't ever play soccer with Carrie. She will break your legs before she lets you score a goal off of her. Carrie is very stubborn. Now, if I ever had to say something to Carrie that she didn't want to hear, she would always get really mad at me. And then I would feel, oh, oh, oh no, she's really mad at me. Well, you know, that's kind of the price you pay for being a dad. But I would feel like Paul. It's like, you know, I didn't mean to upset you. You know, I told you this out of love. I'm sorry that I brought you pain. Are you okay? Will you talk to me? Is everything all right? I mean, I really think we're seeing sort of this human side of Paul here. If anyone has caused grief, 
he has not so much grieved me as he has grieved all of you to some extent, not to put it too severely. If you have a troublemaker or a sinner among you, he hasn't just upset me. He's upset the whole body of Christ, including in the local church in Corinth. Sin in your members is a much more serious thing than you realize. See, even in trying to make up to them, he can't help but correct them. Maybe your moms or dads are like that. The punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient. Now listen to this. If he's talking about the same case he referred to in his last letter, remember he said, in effect, throw him out of the church and, and consign him to Satan so that he might repent. If it's the same case, now he's saying, okay, enough is enough. The punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient. Now, instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him, assuming that he's repented, and apparently he has, so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. So he's being pastoral. He's not giving up the truth. He's speaking the truth in mercy, and he's keeping the balance between punishment and forgiveness once the punished person has repented. I think we can assume that he has. Of course, then in the gospel, we have these fascinating things. People often wonder, especially when it comes to Pharaoh, soon in Exodus, we'll be dealing with, Exodus says, God hardens Pharaoh's heart. And people wonder what that means. I think we can get a, a, a clue here in the gospels. The disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Why would that be? Is Jesus esoteric? Is he saying, I'm only going to share my secrets with certain people, but not with others? No, I think there's a reason behind this. The reason is the truth and the mercy of the gospel finds a place in the hearts of those who are willing to receive it. In fact, that's the point of the parable of the sower, which he just told and which he will interpret in the next day's readings. Good soil receives the seed. Other kinds of soil don't. And so the reason Jesus speaks in parables is to challenge those who resist him. Whoever has, whoever has, uh, whoever has will be given more and they will have abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. Though having eyes, they do not see. Having ears, they do not hear. He's referring to, I think that's Isaiah. Then again, he quotes Isaiah. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah the major prophet of the Old Testament. And Isaiah is condemning through the Holy Spirit by, who has inspired Isaiah to say this, which Jesus is quoting, people who aren't open to the truth, soil that is not receptive to the seed of God. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused their hearts are hardened. They hardly hear with their eyes and they have ears and they hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and I would heal them. In other words, your heart becomes hardened when you yourself do something to harden it. And then God allows that consequence to take hold. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see but did not see it and to hear what you hear but did not hear it. Students, if these readings stir the good soil of your heart in any way, it's God seeking to find root there to blossom and to grow. But if you close the word of God off, A, by never reading it, as most Catholics do, B, by never reading it seriously and meditatively, it cannot take hold and your heart will grow calloused and hardened. You will have eyes, but you will not see. You will have ears, but you will not hear. 
and you will never understand the mysteries of the parables, which are meant to entice you and to be perhaps a stumbling block for those who are not of goodwill. Well, more tomorrow, God willing.